Oh yeah, there we go. Good. Uh, yeah, well, so good morning. Uh, like Bruce said, uh, my name is, is uh, Joel Stegman, and um, for those of you who haven't uh, had the chance to uh, be around since I've been here, I think this is my third time preaching uh, here since uh, last April, uh, my wife Julie and I, uh, there's Julie there, um, are, are currently in the process of preparing ourselves to plant a church. And we currently are serving at a church in downtown Minneapolis called Hope Community Church. Um, and um, we, have, we are uh, church planners and residents there. And so right now we're uh, preparing to plant sometime in the next year and a half. We're kind of eyeing the fall of 2018 in the city's area. And so um, what we've been doing is, is getting opportunities to uh, grow in that. And one of, the, one of the big things, obviously, is opportunities to grow in, in preaching, communicating God's Word. And so... Uh, Pastor Bruce has graciously uh, given, given me some opportunities to get up and, and to use you as, as my practicing group of people. Uh, so thanks a lot for that. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, not really. But uh, So my wife, Julie, not able to be here today. Um, I know she has been here and met some of you in the past. She actually works full-time at Hope, and since um, when you work at a church, Sunday is kind of game day. It's a little hard for her to get away to come down here. And so um, pa- Pastor Bruce and I were joking that uh, you have to, we have to have all the staff be at the church um, because if, if something happens to all the rest of them, someone's got to go up there and run the service, kind of like uh, the designated survivor. Uh, it's, a, it's a politics joke. There's a, there's a show about that. So if, if ever, something happens to everybody else at the church, then Julie's got to go run everything. And so she's got to be there just in case. Um, so she wasn't able to be here with us today. Um, this is a, a picture of us in Seattle. We recently went out to Seattle on a little vacation, which was awesome. Uh, I, I loved Seattle. Uh, even though it was raining the whole time, I actually really enjoyed that. Um, and uh, you'll notice I'm wearing a Washington Husky sweatshirt. Um, and you may think, oh, that's why he must have went to Seattle. He's a big uh, Washington fan or something like that. That's actually not true. I forgot my luggage bag. We got to the airport and I realized I'd forgotten my whole luggage bag. So we got out to Seattle and I had to buy a bunch of clothes and I figured I might as well uh, buy a souvenir sweatshirt while I'm out there. Um, a little update for those of you who, uh, who have heard from us in the past. Like I said, we're serving at Hope. But one of the big things that, that I'll be getting an opportunity to do this summer is uh, in East St. Paul there's a church Whose, uh, whose pastor is going on a sabbatical for the summer. And while he's gone, I will be filling in for him, basically, uh, leading the church as, as a full-time pastor, which will be a, a really great opportunity. And hopefully, at the end of the three months, I haven't completely ruined the church. So you can be praying uh, for me in that this summer. I would really appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to be talking today through Mark 2, 13 to 17. And the title of my sermon is Jesus, Savior of the Sick. When Bruce asked for me to come back and preach, and he said, you can, you know, we're doing a series in Mark, you can preach that, or you can preach whatever you want to preach through. And I said, no, I'd really like to do Mark, uh, because um, preaching through the Gospels is just an t- awesome uh, experience, I think. Because um, we have all of these uh, beliefs and creeds and things we believe that, that mark us out as Christians. And when we read through the Gospels, we get to see those things not just believed or talked about, but embodied in a person, in the person of Jesus. And so uh, we're going to see that today. We're going to see him, and I'm going to try to bring him alive for you today as this, as this real figure. You know, we're not just picturing him as someone who's on a stained glass window or someone that we can't see, that we pray to, or we believe that his death did something, his death and resurrection did something for us. We're going we're gonna to try to picture him as a real person. And that's why the Gospels are so awesome to preach through. Um, I think I'm really excited. And and I thought, you know, when I saw the passage Bruce wanted me to go through, I was like, oh, this is is a money one. This is like, this is such a great one. I I feel really lucky that I get to preach through it. He could have given me something really hard, and he didn't. So thanks, Bruce. Um, Anyway, let me read the passage to you today. Mark 2, 13 to 17. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told them, and Levi got up and followed him. 
While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So the goal today is to break this passage up into three sections, uh, basically those three paragraphs. The first uh, section will be where Jesus calls Levi or or Matthew. Uh, Secondly, we'll be talking about Jesus' apparently bad eating habits in in terms of his choice of the people he was eating with. And then third, uh, we'll be talking about how Jesus has come for the sick. So first of all, Jesus calls Levi or Matthew. Uh, I'll read it again here. Once again, Jesus went up beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. So at this point in the, in the story of Mark, uh, Jesus is already starting to become kind of a, a rock star, kind of a, a guy that, that people are following around. I have this, this picture of a celebrity followed by paparazzi. Uh, it's kind of the same thing right now. People are, are following him around, and, and they want to hear him teach. They want to see him do stuff, because... At this point, you know, you know, even though we're only in chapter 2, and, and Mark is a book that you know, is a short one. It's the shortest of all the Gospels. So Mark packs a lot in to a little bit of space. So even in chapter 2, Jesus has been doing enough stuff uh, that is going to get a bunch of people to want to follow him. He's called some disciples. He's driven out a spirit. Uh, he healed and exercised in front of a whole city. He healed a man with leprosy. And then just right before this, he just healed a paralyzed man. Um, and people are starting to recognize this, this Jesus guy, uh, there's something about him. And it's important for us to understand that they didn't just see him as like a magician, this guy who could do these cool things, and so we're going to follow him around and see what he'll do next. There's one of two things that people are starting to understand about Jesus at this point. Okay, at worst, this guy is a, a prophet, like an Old Testament style prophet. Something we, we haven't really seen, a guy who is going to come around and speak the word of God in truth and perform these signs and miracles in a long time. It had been a long time since in Israel they had seen anything like that. So now to have a guy coming around, uh, preaching that the kingdom of God was here, and doing these signs that accompanied it to show that he was from God, people are thinking at worst he's a prophet. And that's a big deal. So of course we're going to be following him around. Okay? Now at best, at best, and this is again, this is something that to them would have been speculative, but they would have been hoping, they would have been hopeful that this could have been the case, that he could be the Messiah. Now the Messiah is the one who was promised in the Old Testament to come and save Israel. He had been this one that there had been this expectant waiting for. And so people are going to be following him around, wanting to know what... What's up with this guy? Could he actually be that? Could he be more than a prophet? Could he be this king that was supposed to come on behalf of God and to bring salvation to the, to the people, to announce to the people that uh, God had now come back and was, was wanting to redeem the nation of Israel and the people within it, like he had always said he was going to do through all the previous prophets. So you understand why this large crowd is following him around. People are excited about the prospect uh, of what Jesus is. And, um, of course, everyone thought they wanted to follow him around so that they could maybe be part of his, his crew. And what he's going to do is going to surprise everyone because he's not necessarily going to reach out to them. He's going to call someone that nobody expected him to call. As he walked along, Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Uh, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. Now, Levi the tax collector, is almost certainly Matthew, the guy who wrote the book of Matthew. Uh, we know this because in Matthew 9.9, 9, which is a parallel to this same story in the book of Matthew, it says that he saw a man named Matthew sitting at a tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. So um, we, have, uh, we have just assumed that Levi is, is actually just Matthew. So if you hear me use either name throughout the sermon, I'm referring to the same guy. I'll probably say Levi a little more just because that's what Mark says here. Um, but, but Christian uh, history has always understood this to be the calling of, of Matthew, the author of the Gospel of Matthew. So no small thing. Uh, God had big plans in store for this guy in calling him. 
what, what, was, what was up with being a tax collector? It's important for us to understand exactly what Jesus is doing and what kind of person he's calling to understand uh, the story that we're going through. So um, when you had tax collection in, in the first century, in the first century uh, Judea and Galilee in Jerusalem, it could have been one of two types. Uh, first of all, it could have been a collection of tariffs, which are, um, uh, would be tax that would be given if you were shipping something into a new area, shipping some kind of good or trade in. And it says in, in verse 13 that Jesus was by the sea when this happened. So it could well have been that uh, when people came in, they're right next to the Sea of Galilee. And uh, it's important to know that the, the Sea of Galilee is, has a bunch of different territories around it. So you could leave one side and be in one territory and get to their side of the lake and you're in another uh, territory which means that now you've got to get taxed on, on some goods that you're trying to ship in. Okay. The second type of tax that it could have been would have uh, been if you are crossing from one of those territories to another. Um, Herod the Great was this uh, great king or, or sub-king under, under the Roman rulers who ruled the whole area. And when he died, he broke his kingdom up into a couple of different portions under his two sons. And the two sons, like... Uh, brothers tend to do, didn't get along and fought with each other. And so what they did is, if you passed from one guy's territory into the next, they would tax you for just showing up into the new territory. Uh, how annoying is that, right? Here's, here's a little map of it. You see that uh, the Sea of Galilee is that, um, not that body of water at the very top there, but the one underneath it, the little bit of a bigger one. And you see how there are these three territories that are all kind of converging on there. So if you traveled from one space to another you had to pay a tax. Um, this is obviously terribly annoying and is going to cause you to probably uh, dislike these people who are taxing you. Um, and what's more so, uh, even more reason to hate these guys who are trying to take your money, is that these tax collectors, they, made their, they weren't like paid a, a salary for doing this. If they wanted to make a living, they had to take that off the top of the tax that they were paying. So if I was going to tax you $10, I'd throw in an extra $2 to make my living. And it was well known that a lot of these tax collectors would uh, increase that tax and, and to a, a degree that was a little bit ridiculous. And, and, and it kind of made people pretty angry. So for a bunch of reasons, these tax collectors are pretty despised. And it's not like we're we're without our own versions of tax collectors today. The IRS is, is, is our version of it today. And the IRS, these people aren't making their living off of um, uh, taking, you know, off the top. And we still dislike them. Here's a, this is from an MSN article. The IRS has never been an easy place to work. It's 84,000 employees, 65% of them women, generally don't tell people outside the service where they draw a paycheck. They don't tell people where they work because they know that people will hate them because of it. It's no way to make friends. They toil in purposely anonymous buildings. A big sign outside might attract crazies. So people don't even know that this building is an IRS building because they know uh, it, could, it could cause some uh, controversy outside of it. In 2010, an anti-government zealot flew a single-engine plane into a building in Austin, Texas, where 190 agency employees worked, killing one of them. Well, Mr. Big Brother IRS man, let's try something different. Take my pound of flesh and sleep well, the pilot, Joseph Stack III, wrote in a six-page suicide note. Okay, so no one likes tax collectors. I don't know if any of you here work for the IRS, and I'm sorry for you if you do, I guess. Um, but let's just think about what it would have been like to be Levi then. If this is his job, it's easy to think of him as like this terrible guy, but let's actually think about it from his perspective, how, what it would have been like to be this person who, who was collecting tax. Um, here's, a, here's a quote, I think, that really sums it up well. Think about what it does to you on the inside if you're putting on that fixed smile six days a week, 50 weeks a year. It's not a great way to be human. It does things to you. And the troubling thing is that Levi may not have well wanted very much to be a toll collector. The system needed someone, and it found him. And so the social isolation the cold shoulder from polite society was probably reflected in the way that he felt about himself. So it's easy to think that Levi was probably this greedy guy who thought, hey, I can be a tax collector and I can make all this money skimming off the top. And that may well have been true, but it's more likely uh, that he 
he, he was doing this because he didn't really have anything else to do. He needed a job. The system needed someone to do this, and he thought, you know, this is, this is what I guess what I'll do to make, make a living. And as a result of that, uh, people are going hate, gonna to hate him. And so it's not probably, uh, it's probably not that Levi didn't know who Jesus was when he's walking around in the sea and this crowd is following him. But Levi probably is sitting there thinking, there's no way that this guy, who at worst is a prophet and at best is the Messiah who's come to save Israel, he probably doesn't want anything to do with me. So that's why we see that Levi wasn't following Jesus around. But I'm sure he would have if he, if he could have. If he would have thought this great uh, teacher, this great prophet, possibly this great Messiah, would have wanted something to do with him, I'm sure he would have followed him. But he probably didn't think that this guy wanted anything to do with him because of the way that society around him made him think about who he was. But Jesus does call him. He says, follow me. That's the call to Levi. And a call has two parts to it. First of all, it communicates that Levi is worth something to Jesus. Jesus, in the very act of saying to Levi, I want you to come and follow me, specifically, isolating him, singling him out and saying, come follow me, as opposed to the rest of this crowd, um, that's a shocking thing. Probably to the people who are following Jesus, as we're going to find out, following him around, and to Levi himself. I'm sure no one is more surprised than Levi to hear that Jesus wanted him to come follow him. So that, that in and of itself communicates a lot. Think how much that would have changed Levi's outlook on who he was to have this guy single him out and call him. But it wasn't just that. It wasn't just that Jesus wanted to uh, call him to himself and say, you're worth something to me. It's that he wanted to redeem and remake Levi. He wanted to take Levi, this guy who, like we said, there's no way to know if he was skimming off the top, if he did fit the stereotype of what a tax collector would have been. He very well could have um, Jesus didn't want to leave him in that state then, this state of, of, of someone who's a sinner, who we're going to talk about here, the someone who needed to be saved. That's kind of the whole point, right? Jesus wanted to redeem and remake him. And it, it wasn't just that Jesus was kind of calling everyone and saying, like, you're all great, right? This inclusivity, this, this big kind of lazy tolerance. That's not what Jesus is doing here because um, it's, in, in a lot of ways you could say, well, it's kind of intolerant for you to say, Hey, you got to come follow me. And, and by the way, uh, you need to repent because you're a sinner. Because that's something that Jesus does all the time. Even to people who are, who are marginalized, who are oppressed, people who are at the bottom of the system, Jesus still says, listen, you, I want you to follow me, but you've got to recognize uh, that you, you're a sinner. You need to repent. Um, and then he offers them forgiveness. That can seem almost condescending maybe to some people that you need to be forgiven. But Jesus does all this in addition to calling them so that he can redeem and remake them. Make them something brand new through what he's doing. Because Jesus assumes, like everybody, that Levi needs salvation. So he wants to call him and then redeem and remake him. So this is all hugely important for us as we think about this. I'm going to move on to the next section now. Uh, Mark 2, uh, 15 to 16. Jesus' bad eating habits. Okay? Um, while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house... Many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? All right, so uh, who were the Pharisees? They haven't shown up yet in in the narrative, but they're going to be hugely important as we move forward. As many of you, I I, no doubt, are, are well aware the Pharisees are, are really important players because Jesus kind of brushes up with them quite a bit. So it's important to understand right now, especially even to understand this, this section, who are these guys? Why are they important? Why do they feel the need to criticize Jesus? And why does Mark specifically highlight them in his narrative? Why does he actually call them out and say specifically these guys were, uh, are doing stuff? So the Pharisees are like a, it, it's kind of hard to explain whether, who they, what they were like in like modern terms, but they were like a social pressure group probably is a good way to think of them. Almost like a lobbying group, maybe. And um, they were semi-organized and and what they cared about was the purity of the nation. They thought that through observance to the law, they could get God to bring his kingdom in now. 
uh, they could get God to act in the world if, as long as they observed God's law perfectly. So perfectly that they added stuff to it. Stuff that's not even in the Old Testament anywhere. They added stuff to that. And that's what a lot of the dis- disputes are going to be uh, as, as you move forward and as you read the other Gospels is that Jesus is doing things that they think break the law when in reality uh, Jesus is just not doing the stuff that they thought that you needed to do. And all this, they had a goal to it. Um, the Pharisees are extremely popular with the lower class. All the, the, most of the, the group, the lower class group, the vast majority of the people living in the, in the territory of Israel at the time um, would have looked at the Pharisees as being very popular. They were, they were kind of a, a popular group to them. And because of that, even though they didn't hold any official political power, most Pharisees weren't a part of the ruling class in any way. That would have been the chief priests and the, and the um, Sadducees, uh, who you'll hear about a little bit later on as well. Um, they were the ones that held the actual political power, but the Pharisees, because of their popularity, held de facto political power. Uh, the way that the, all the people went, a lot of times, was the way that the government went, even if they weren't a democracy, because there was always the fear that this lower class would rise up in revolt. So you wanted to make them happy, so they don't overthrow the ruling class. And the Pharisees, be, because of that, held a lot of, of political power. And they were also, in what we would say today, what, what the word conservative means, they were very conservative in their views. Um, they, unlike the Sadducees, believed in, in a resurrection from the dead. Um, they believed all of, all of Scripture up to that point was God's word, whereas the Sadducees only thought the first five books of, of the Old Testament were. And so... They were, they were very uh, staunch in those views, and that made them very popular and attractive to people. And it's Im- important to know, they were also excited for the Messiah to come to. So they, they would have also been hopeful that this guy might have been the Messiah. Um, but, and he, he was, obviously, as, as we know. But um, when he's going around doing stuff like eating with Levi, this throws them off. Because they were looking for a Messiah, uh, as we'll see, that, that they thought fit their standards for what a Messiah should look like. Um, uh, Jerome Nere says, the Pharisees criticized Jesus who claims to teach a way of holiness for eating with tax collectors and sinners because shared table fellowship implies that Jesus shares their world, not God's world of holiness. So we have to understand in the first century, um, I put this little thing at the top, who, you are who you eat with. We say today you are what you eat. Um, in the first century, who you ate with said a lot about who you were who your identity group was. So what you, you know, if you were going to be this, this guy who taught this holiness stuff, um, like Jesus was, uh, you shouldn't eat with the wrong people. These people that would make you almost uh, impure uh, by eating with them. And T. Wright says, uh, this would not have been of any significance if Jesus were acting as a private individual. You know, who cares? If you want to eat with sinners and defile yourself by doing that, well, good riddance. We don't really give a rip. But when it is allied with the claim that Jesus was inaugurating the long-awaited kingdom, it becomes deeply symbolic. That is why it aroused controversy. Jesus was, as it were, celebrating the messianic banquet, but he's doing it with all of the wrong people. So the Pharisees thought, when this Messiah comes, they're, he's going to uh, approve us, and, and he's going to get in line with what we want the Messiah to look like. Because we've been the ones who've been searching through uh, the scriptures and saying this is what it should look like. And so um, we have, feel like we have the power and authority to tell uh, any Messiah who would come along what he should actually look like. Um, and when Jesus comes and eats with this tax collector, he's making a social statement about who he's come for and who he hasn't come for. Because he could have eaten with the Pharisees, and he does actually eat with the Pharisees at other points. So it's not like uh, you know, Jesus eats with everybody, actually. He, he ate and drank with a lot of different people. There's a lot of stories about that. But in this particular situation, um, he's saying, I've come for, the, for people like Levi, people like these tax collectors. Um, and so, you know, he's not here to appease the people who mattered, the people who, who thought that they mattered, who, the people who many of the ordinary people thought matter. Jesus is here. I'm not, I'm not here to appease any of them. I don't, want, I don't need to make them happy. I'm, I'm the one that's from God, even though these Pharisees, they think that they're the ones that represent God in all, all of his interests. And so the, re, so the Pharisees are upset because he doesn't comply with their ideas of holiness and not identifying with their group. And because of that, because they were so, they felt so strongly 
that God had approved them as the group uh, who were truly speaking on behalf of them, Jesus then couldn't be from God because he didn't assimilate with their groups and their practices. This, this belief that they were the ones that were representing God in the world um, made it so they couldn't believe that Jesus was truly from God. And we'll see later on that the Pharisees will start to criticize Jesus as, well, maybe you, you know, through, through the devil you're making these works because it can't be through God. In their minds, it couldn't be through God that, that, that these works were being accomplished, these healings and these uh, miracles that are being accomplished. It couldn't be from God because we're the ones that speak for God. So, like, well, I don't know what you're doing, man, but it's not speaking for God. Um, and they think there's a, a challenge in there for us um, because the Pharisees are not the only group of people in history who have felt the need uh, or the desire to take on and try to approve and say um, what... God's word or who God is should look like. We, instead of trying to shape Christ or shape scripture, we should, tr- we should make sure we're always shaped by Christ. Because throughout history, lots of people have twisted scripture to say something that uh, justifies them or approves what they really want to say in order to get people to follow them. And that's the same thing that the Pharisees are doing here. Uh, many times we want the power or people want the power to approve or disapprove what God's word says. And you'll do that through taking verses out of, you know, people will do that through taking verses out of context. Um, we'll do that by highlighting certain books of the Bible as opposed to others so that it sounds more like what we want it to say and not taking all of Scripture. He'll come through um, trying to tell people that you can only understand this passage this way and, and not this other way. And, and so uh, the challenge here for us is to make sure that instead of trying to shape scripture and Christ to fit what we want it to look like. We need to be shaped instead by Jesus himself uh, and not be like the Pharisees. Instead, respond to Jesus um, and take him at his word, to take the Bible at its word and to be shaped by that instead. All right, my third and final uh, section here, Jesus has come uh, for the sick. Verse 17, Um, it says, On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Uh, I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners. Um, Just think about what it meant meant to Levi to hear that. So you hear actually Jesus say, um, Yeah, I'm here for people like Levi. That is is my goal here. It It is not to come and cater to you Pharisees. You people who think you have the power to approve. Um, what I should be doing. I've come for these other people who, who, ad, who admit they need me. Um, as I've been thinking about this, and, and uh, I just was struck by this image. Uh, this is a picture of this giant statue in Brazil. Christ the Redeemer, it's called. And he sits over uh, the city of Rio de Janeiro. That's the city in the background here. This giant mountain, giant statue overlooking the city with his arms wide open. So, I don't know how many of you follow, follow the Olympics at all, but the Olympics were held recently in Rio de Janeiro. And in the lead up to it, uh, all this attention was focused on the city and it was a mess. <laughs> uh, the stuff that people found out was just crazy. It was a, it was a gong show that was going on in, in Rio. Um, we, we found out that there's this Zika virus that, that was, was affecting people there. And so a lot of athletes were afraid to go down there for afraid of getting sick of this virus. And a lot of people in other countries are afraid of sending... Uh, there are citizens there, because what happens when they come back? If they catch this virus, then we have an epidemic on our hands. Uh, athletes got robbed <laughs> by people while they were there in Rio de Janeiro. Um, this in- insane water pollution was discovered that was going on as the city was getting ready. You couldn't drink the water there. Um, and, and the spotlight on the city uh, showed that there was this, all this government corruption that was going on. So when you know that about Rio de Janeiro and you look at this picture still and you still see that picture of Jesus standing over it with his arms wide open, um, it, it's a, I think it's a symbolic picture as a reminder of what's going on in this story that Jesus has come to redeem, uh, redeem and remake and shape and to call uh, places like sick, uh, broken places like, like, like that city was presented as in the media. You know, him standing over it with his arms wide open is a is a uh, call to them to say, this is why I've come. It's for stuff like this. Not to marginalize it, not to make fun of it, not to continue in oppressing it, but to call it to myself, to redeem and remake it. 
Um, why did Jesus do that? Why would he have come for, to do that? Because uh, the world is a sick place. It's made sick by people who are sick because of Adam who made them sick. We're all in Adam's line. We're all fallen and sick because of, of what, what happened in the, in the garden. So we have is you have sinful humans, sick people, many of whom are kings and rulers. Even though they're sick, they're still ruling things. It, like Herod and, and, and his sons, this, their squabble, right? That petty argument that led to this taxing that would go on for people who, in, in going different places, right? Um, and, what, and it was just for their luxury. You know, just, just to give themselves more money, they, they throw this tax on for people. That creates a desperate group of people. It creates a group of people that are going to hate the people who collect the tax, but also create a space where uh, some people need to be those tax collectors just to make a living. And um, those people, in turn, become hated because of the, the work of these sick people um, who are made sick because of Adam, and because the people there are sick themselves, um, they're hated. And they take that hate on a lot of times. They're shaped by that hate. Become like that, you know? We talked about how Levi maybe saw himself in the way that people uh, saw him. He became to act like that in many ways. And they become, uh, become those people that they were stereotyped as, even if maybe that was never the reason that Levi got into that. And because of all of that, that, that working out of all of the sickness, um, uh, we all need to be saved like Levi. And Jesus knew that, and that's why he came. That's what he came and saw himself doing as the Messiah, to, to get rid of the root of all of these problems. Um, that's what Jesus is fixing. And Levi is the example of that. He may have been deserving of these stereotypes, um, but he still was likely weary uh, for this true Messiah to come and to to save him, uh, to be that redeemer for him, to be that doctor for him because he was sick. So this should offer us a challenge and a comfort. Okay, the challenge, first of all, is in those who claim to, be, to, to see, who claim to be healthy, when really they're not. Because the way that Jesus talks about it in our passage which, that we're going through today, it's like, I've come for the people that are sick, not for the people that are healthy. I've come for sinners, not the righteous. Now, you could read that and say, well, that means that there are some people who are sick, but there are some people that are righteous too, and maybe I'm one of those people that doesn't need them. Uh, maybe I'm one of those righteous people that Jesus didn't come for. Uh, well, in John 9, 39 to 41, Jesus kind of goes a little further, and he says, uh, For judgment I have come into the world, so that the blind will see, and those uh, who, will, who see will become blind. Some Pharisees were with him, heard him say this, and asked, What, are we blind too? And Jesus said, If you were blind... You would not be guilty of sin, but now that you claim you, you can see, your guilt remains. This is in a section where Jesus heals a blind person in, in John 9, and um, he uses this as a metaphor for spiritual blindness. Uh, to say to the Pharisees, you think that you see when, and, you know, I've healed this guy, I've taken this guy who was blind and made him so he can see. And when, when you look at that and you say that this guy's not from God, that we don't need the same um, healing that this guy needed, then you actually are showing yourself to be blind. And that's the challenge to the person who hears, uh, the, hears Jesus say, I've come for the sick and, and not, the, not the healthy, and says, well, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm healthy then. I don't, need it. I don't need someone. You are showing yourself to be blind in, in, in saying that you already see. That same challenge is here for us um, if we don't respond to Jesus. And, and knowing that, <laughs> think how much it would have bothered the Pharisees to know that Jesus wasn't going to stop with just eating with sinners. He's going to die for them. That was the goal of this Messiah, this great, this great leader that people have been waiting for. The only leader, the anointed one, who's been promised for centuries to come, was going to come and he's going to die for sinners. He wasn't just going to eat with them. He wasn't just going to be nice to them. He was going to die for them. And if you're like the Pharisees, this will eat you up inside to think that Jesus came for these people that you, want, you, you think aren't worth it. You know, you think uh, maybe I'm the only one that's worth it. It's going to eat you up if you can't realize that we're all sick. We all are on the same level playing ground. Um, we talk a lot of, you know, we, there's this view in the media a lot of times that the church sees itself as this self-righteous group who wants to go around and make everyone, uh, you know, act a certain way, and they're these, you know, we're these highfalutin righteous people, and 
Uh, you know, a lot of that, I think, is, is not true. But, but we have to be careful to make sure that we aren't playing into that stereotype. If we ever see the church as this place, um, this place that is, it, as this quote says, a museum of saints um, and not a hospital for sinners, then we're missing the point. Um, the church is not supposed to be this place where we hang out and say, hey, we're, we're, we're better than everyone else, and we're part of the, the club of the blessed. You know, Jesus has come for us, and so now we're awesome, and everyone else, it's not a part of our group. They kind of suck. You're forgetting the whole reason you're here in the first place, if you do that. If that's your view of everything, then you need to, you need to reset uh, what's going on in your mind. Because the, the, the whole point is that we're all like Levi. We all need uh, to be called like Levi, and then to be remade or, or reshaped by Christ. Um, because that call to Levi is the same one um, that is offered to us. You know, we are, we are told, and, and listen, many of you in here may feel like Levi did. You may feel, um, you may feel for whatever reason, like you're not worth anything. You may feel like, you know, I'm, I'm this, you're right, all the stereotypes about me are true. But I'm going to take that on. Um, you need to hear that Jesus is, is calling you, which means you're worth something to him. Um, he wouldn't be calling you if that wasn't true. You wouldn't be in this room if that wasn't true. Um, and maybe, maybe you need to be reminded that, um, you know, Jesus wants to redeem and remake you so that now we, like Jesus, can go out and, and be a part of his efforts to redeem and, and remake the world with him. Um, you know, the whole point of, of, a, of, a, of, of a doctor is to... Uh, to hopefully get someone, not just, you know, not just to cure the, the illness, but to, you know, we do therapy. Um, if you, let's say you, uh, you tear muscle or something like that, you're going to do therapy to try to make the muscle stronger than it was before. That's the whole, the whole point, and that's what, um, that's what Jesus is doing. He's not, just, he's not just coming and dying for us so that now we're not sick anymore. He wants to actually invite us to, to be remade, to be like him, so that we go out and, and are with him in that mission to redeem and save the world, to bring it all back to himself. That's what we get to do now, just like Levi did, right? Levi um, gets called by Jesus, gets redeemed and remade, and then he becomes an apostle. He becomes a, someone who writes a book of the Bible. So G- Jesus' goal with him was never just to get him out of the state. It was always to make him something new, something better than he was before it. So, I want to end this by, by reiterating to you. If you are sitting in this room, then that means that you are, you are like Levi. You are unwanted and you're sick. We can't forget that. That is at the heart of Christianity. And then to be reminded that that's okay. That's okay because that's what grace is all about. Is, is, is God coming and taking people who aren't deserving of it and then saving them, remaking them, shaping them, calling them to himself. Um, and I think, um, and now as we move into a time of communion, I don't think there's any better way um, to celebrate this right now than to take communion together. Um, you know, when we take communion, we are, we are saying, we are reminding ourselves um, that Jesus, this is Jesus' body that's broken for us. It's his blood that's shed on behalf of us. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three to 26, it says, The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. When we come and take communion, we are are reminding ourselves, we are showing to ourselves and to the world that we are people who are... um, who are shaped by Christ's death for us. We are, uh, we are communicating that to ourselves in the world in remembrance of Christ's sacrifice for us, that though we were sick, he came uh, to heal us, to call us to himself, to redeem us, to make us healthy again, um, to save us. So we are now um, no longer affected by the fall of Adam, by the sin and the sickness around us and that was in us, but we are people who are redeemed and made new because of it. Um, so, uh, if you, so a little, little instructions for you. If you're not a member of, of City on a Hill, uh, you don't have to be in order to participate. Um, you can come up to the table whenever you're ready during the worship song and, and feel free to take the elements here at the table 
or take them back with you um, to your seat. So um, before, we, before we do that, before we enter this time of worship, I'm going to uh, close us in prayer. Lord, I pray that you would, uh, you would remind us now as we take communion and as we go out that you have um, you've called us, um, like Levi, people who, who didn't deserve for you to come for us. Um, people who, uh, who are in the outside looking in. Um, people who are sinners um, and not righteous. People who are sick and not healthy. You came for us and you called us, God. Um, you came with the... Uh, with the goal of redeeming us and remaking us and shaping us into the image of your Son, giving us your Spirit so that we may, we may now, um, instead of being part of the problem, be part of the solution. Um, that we may experience fellowship with you, Lord, that was lost in the garden. And that we may, um, we may now uh, celebrate in your death for us, God. We thank you so much for that. We praise you. I pray that the people here at City and Hill will be shaped by that truth um, in all of their lives and everything that they do, God. Um, I pray all these things in Jesus' name.